Welcome to another edition of Musicians with Joe Kelly. I'm extremely excited this afternoon slash evening. My next guest is a pillar of the Minneapolis music sound. He is a award-winning musician, producer, songwriter. He grew up with Prince, was Prince's best friend, played with Morris Day and all the young cats making a name for themselves in the Twin Cities. He's produced Grammy award-winning artists such as Jody Watley, Adam Ant, Tina Turner, Jermaine Stewart, The Girls. That's a that's a great album. He's released several solo albums of his own, and he has a new album just around the corner. He's blessed us with two funk songs already this summer and a belated happy birthday to our next guest, Andre Simone. How you doing, Andre? I'm good, Joe. How you doing? Yeah, you, you've been uh, getting those frequent flyer miles, right? This summer? <laughs> no, yeah. I've been traveling around and, you know, just trying to stay busy and Keeping my fingers on the pulse, you know what I mean. That's right. Yeah, we we um, I was catching up on some of the pictures. You you went back home, uh, Minneapolis, and what was going on there? Something real special to your heart, right? Yeah, a couple of things. Uh, one thing is um, they're naming a street, the street that uh, that I grew up on, um, where kind of we kind of got our music jumped off at. Uh, um, they're naming it after my mother. It's gonna mm -hmm. gonna be called Birded That Way. So I burned it Anderson way. So yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. And I was also there because Spike um, Spike Moss, who um, ran a community center that gave us our first opportunity to play in front of a crowd. Um, yeah, they honored him with a, um, a street named after his the area right where the community center was. Um, unfortunately, it's a police station now, but uh, it used to be a community center. So right. So but you, cool. your 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 mom, for those that don't know, was a real crucial part of your upbringing, but others, Prince and, and just the community, she was well known. In. And uh, tell us a little bit about your mom and the significance of what you brought to the community and your life. You know, my mom was, you know, basically to give you a quick brief overview, she was, um, got separated from her family at a really young age, got pregnant at 14, had uh, my oldest brother at 15, got married, uh, raised six amazing children with my father, Fred Anderson. and. Uh, you know, um, went back to school, worked hard, um, got her education, and I uh, actually basically became the director of the YWCA, had um, one of the YWCAs named after her. Um, she um, really helped a lot of teens in the community in the area. Um, basically, our family won Family of the Year, which uh, right. is an amazing picture that uh, includes myself, my siblings and Prince, who at the time my, my mother actually adopted. Um, and so he lived with us for several years during during that period of time. And, uh, you know, basically we were able to, you know, she allowed us to do our music um, and uh, allowing us to do our music allowed a lot of other musicians in the neighborhood and the mm -hmm. sort of community, a place to come and hang out and, and just, you know, feel comfortable, you know, playing music. So your house was the, the home where the neighborhood kids would gravitate towards and their parents had to say, call them for dinner, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. No, exactly like that. It was, it, yeah. was, it was the hub. Yeah. Right. Now, we've had multiple friends of yours from Minneapolis. And um, Pe I was thinking back prior to you coming on the air, Peppy Willie, a while back, I, I put up an interview. He made mention about you and Prince when you worked. There was something so advanced, you and Prince, working with him in the studio. He, he was just amazed. Remember the remember those days you were working on a few things, right? Yeah, we worked on a lot. I mean, you know, um, Pepe was um, introduced to us. We we did a gig at a, a, a ski chalet. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, I think he was having some sort of a wedding or reception party, or something. I don't know, but um, we you know we were, we were introduced to him uh, um, by Morris's mother, who was managing us at the time, and. Uh, Basically, you know, we met him and he, you know, she said he was a record producer from New York and, you know, and um, so he kind of, you know, showed us a few things here and there about um, making music um, and making, actually, production. He showed us how to put time fills and <laughs> oh, okay. places and things like that. It was, it was actually really kind of cool, though, I have to say, because, um, you know, we were just, you know, because we were so young, we were just, you know, um, really excited to learn new stuff. And um, uh -huh. How how patient were you guys at that age to to correct things and work like that? Or you guys just press play and record it and that was it? Uh, we were not patient at all. Um, <laughs> no, 
he had no real interest in in, uh, in indulging in that at first. Right. I mean, until he actually showed that he, you know, he really um, had some some real skills to offer. Because we we you know at that point we pretty much, I mean, we yeah you know, we used to play four hour sets, so yeah. we you know we played all the music that was out at the time. So we knew music production because um, mm -hmm. we played it literally on, right. a, on a regular basis. So um, so it was a little bit interesting. But you know um, but he he definitely came with some things that we just did not. You know, anticipate and really didn't think of, and it, it definitely brought, um, you know, brought some color to what we were trying to do at the time. So, so when you're growing up there, I, we know a little bit about Prince learning music and everything. Were you guys sitting in the in the living room putting the records on and trying to pick up the grooves and learning your instruments like that? Well, we were a band. I mean, you know, so yeah, we learned everything. You know, we played yeah. everything from, you know, obviously Santana to. Ohio players to Sly and Family Stone to, you know, and then, you know, he and I got into some other stuff because my family had a uh, ridiculously extensive record collection because uh, I'm the youngest of six. Right. So all of them were into different variations of uh, music of the time. So that gave us an opportunity to uh, explore all sorts of different stuff, everything from Laura Nairo to, I mean, you name it. I mean, just, right. you know, just, you know, the Beatles, whatever. Yeah, what what a great upbringing, and from from that stage, wow, it went fast. I'm sure for you guys into your early twenties and like that. And how do yeah. you handle something like that? I mean, it was just I don't I don't think I could handle something like that. Handle I, what? Han, handle you know going from you know woodshedding and and just jamming at, at the local parties into record deals and and starting with the tours at wow early twenties, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. you know, I mean, you have to understand we. Um, had no doubt that that was going to be the outcome. I mean, we were very um, um, focused. Um, you know, I, as, as a kid, I mean, cause I, you know, grew up in a, a different neighborhood than Prince and the other guys. Um, uh, and I was very, very, um, I grew up in a project, so I was very motivated um, <laughs> living in that environment. You, you're gonna be motivated. Um, and so I brought that, I think, I like to think I brought that energy and attitude um, um, and confidence and, um, you know, into that, um, into that neighborhood, into our group, because uh, I guess maybe what, five of the, you know, four of the five members in the group I, you know, I brought into the group. So I was very much a part of putting our band together. So, right. Yeah. Now, now, as far as the instruments in the group, how did you guys settle who was going to play what? Because, I mean, you and Prince could play anything and Morris, Morris as well. How did you guys settle on who's going to play what? Well, at the time, you know, that wasn't the case. You know, obviously, um, you know, my, my father was a bass player, so I learned how to play upright bass, but I didn't have a, a, an electric bass. So okay. I originally wasn't our bass player. Right. Um, so we had, um, but, um, you know, I, you know, I, you know, Prince didn't play bass then because he didn't have a bass and he didn't know how to play bass. Right. Um, and he just he had just gotten a guitar on um, one of his, um, you know, one of his first, you know, of his own guitars. Um, I actually managed to get for him because his father had a guitar, but he wouldn't let him play it very often. Uh, so he really didn't have access that much. And we were able to finally get him a guitar and he could, you know, kind of play. So, you know, I mean, and Morris came later. He was um, he was somebody that used to really kind of sweat me about, you know, um, playing in our band because he'd heard of us and, you know, really wanted in. So, you know, he had assumed, you know, like a lot of people at the time assumed I was the the leader of the band. So he would just sweat me, man, man, I'm real good. I'm real good. <laughs> like, yeah, we already right. got, it. but I'm good. I'm better. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah, but he, he finally talked me into coming and hearing him and he was like, not just better, but just, <laughs> there was no, there was no comparison. He was just unbelievable. And I was like, okay, you're in. And so yeah. that was it. And uh, he brought, had to, had to bring his drums over and they never left as he said. And that's just the way it was. How'd you break it to your, drummer before him? Well, we really didn't get along that well, you know, um, at the time, you know, we was, you know, um, so he was Prince's cousin and, uh, you know, I mean, but, you know, the thing is, I just, you know, I said, well, I figured if Morris set up and play and everybody, the rest of the guys in the band heard, you know, mm, they, yeah. what I knew is that, you know, this is what we need to go to that next level. Cause, right, you know, right. kind of, you know, um, kind of, you know, relegated to a certain kind of thing that we could get into and we really needed. My cousin, um, uh, Tedros Saluki was a, a, one of the most 
you know, amazing drummers in the in the in the city, you know, all over this stuff, both the Twin Cities. And mm -hmm. so uh, he uh, left a uh, a drum set at my mom's house. So I always, I mean, a lot of people don't know, but I can play the drums really, really well. Right, right. <laughs> so I mean, so obviously, um, you know, playing drums is a was a, was a big deal for me. So I was always like, you know, um, right. You know, so when I heard Morris, I was like, this dude, if he, if we all got together, me, him, Prince, you know, um, you know, just that trio. Right, right. Insane. You know, and then once you add, you know, William Dowdy, you know, who's unbelievable percussionist and my sister who can basically play anything. I mean, she's just, right. and the thing about my sister is she um, really doesn't make very many mistakes if any. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Yeah, she was, she was, they called her like the ice lady because she was just like, just serious. So, yeah. That's your sister, Linda, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So she still plays occasionally? You know, I don't think so. You know, she's just, you know, she she got into raising our family. You know, the, the thing about my family is that we had this, you know, family is a big deal for us. And so right. uh, she got into that. And that's kind of one of the main reasons why I kind of stepped out of the off the scene for a while. Because once I started having kids, I really wanted to focus on raising my kids. So I just stepped out of the, you know, out of the spot and, and mm -hmm. just kind of did that and was trying to wait for an opportunity right. to really be able to dive back in and, you know, and kind of, you know, 27 years later. <laughs> hey, that, that happened. It's not uncommon for, for a lot of those stories like that. Yeah, no, it's yeah. a beautiful thing. I have, yeah. I have the most amazing kids, so I'm happy. And you and you're still making great music. I mean, you Thank just you. released this summer um, music from. I love it personally. I mean, I know you're so well rounded. You know, mm -hmm. funk, rock, pop, and mm -hmm. everything. But you know, this is this is just some great funk music. And tell us a little preview on the album, and tell us about the two songs we've already heard. Well, you know, I mean, the, the album is called "The Resurrection of Funk," um, and I think. You know, my goal is to really bring funk music back mm -hmm. to you know the conversation because I think um, you know people have kind of forgotten about you know funk music and and yeah. funk music is kind of the backbone of of hip hop and so many other things that um, you know the idea that you know it's sort of been you know relegated to sort of you know just backing up hip hop artists and things like that just seems you know um, it seems criminal to me and it's like you know right. what so anyway, so I got back into it and I'm really kind of, you know, happy because, you know, the kind of music I'm creating now is the kind of music I created back when I was living at my mom's house when um, when I first started off. And, and so the things, the music that inspired me back then, um, you know, um, was like Sly and the Family Stone and those groups and, you know, the Ohio Players and Parliament Funkadelic, obviously Bootsy and, you right. know, all of you know, James Brown, just there's so many amazing groups back then that were saying something and, you know, and backed it up with amazing performances and attitude and style and, and, yeah. you know, and that's kind of a lost art, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. and, and right now I think there's a, um, there's a, a sort of an opening for uh, somebody to come in and, and sort of reestablish that and really create that, you know, that um, conversation again. And I want to be that person because I mean, I, you know, I really don't get very much credit for mm -hmm. the music that I created. Right, I was right. For creating yeah. back in the day. Um, and a lot of people don't understand why, you know, and it's because, you know, um, you know, the first person out, I, I call it Jeffrey Robinson, <laughs> Jeffrey Robinson theory. <laughs> it's like, and uh he's a guy who used to um live in our neighborhood and, and uh every time I would get a, a new car, he would come and ask me if he could drive it. And uh -huh. uh, and I'd say, sure, go ahead. You know, and he'd drive and he wouldn't come back for a few hours. <laughs> and when he, when he finally would come back, you know, and I'd, I'd drive around in my car, people would say, hey, why are you driving Jeffrey's car? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's kind of the same thing with music. It's like the first person yeah, that comes right. to music. And so I just thought, you know what? Everybody thinks Prince. And if I did it, people say, you're trying to copy Prince. It's like, no, I'm not. <laughs> and so I just thought, well, let me just create some different music. So I, I created, you know, New Wave. And mm -hmm. uh, my record company was, was like, because they heard other stuff. They said, why don't you do that? I said, right. I'm an artist. I like the idea of just creating whatever I want, you know, and, and the idea that there's some sort of musical guardrails or, you know, some sort of um, musical color barrier or something. I just thought, come on, you got to be kidding me. Right. And uh, I 
realize that no, it, it's true. Um, but you know, I mean, I'm going to continue because you know, I actually one of the other things that I, I love. I mean, I still love doing you know rock, and I actually do a lot of folk, and and uh, I actually um, have done like maybe twenty some classical arrangements. So I just do a lot of stuff. I, I love yeah. music. Um, so. So you you got a vault just just along the lines of Prince, right? I mean, you got tons of stuff, I'm sure, in your home. Yeah, it's insane. I mean, you know, I don't obviously have a vault, and you know, right. I'm not even you know, it's not my really not not really my thing. But I just create a lot of music. Yeah, and my vault is a lot of hard drives. <laughs> you know, a well, whole Prince, lot of, uh, Prince was said to have forgot the the code to the the vault, the combination. So you know, was, did you hear that? No, I never heard that. Yeah, I heard like the, the the first vault, he forgot the combination, so he started up another vault or stuff was outside the original vault. When the, when they first came down there and started uh, you know, saving saving the music that was there. Yeah. I mean, you know, the interesting thing about Prince forgetting, you know, him forgetting it, that he has the combination yeah. or it doesn't sound like your buddy. <laughs> or not making a will. I mean, all this stuff is just that's Yeah. The, I know. I mean, and yeah. I knew this guy. I lived with this guy. I mean, yeah, you're you his best friend growing up and I, through I, the years, right? Yeah. So it, it's really, it's really, it's really been, I got to tell you from that standpoint, it's really been interesting, mm -hmm. you know, um, through, through these last, you know, since he passed away um, to be sort of, um, you know, on the outside of a lot of these conversations, because it's just, it's baffling to me because I knew this guy. I yeah. mean, I knew him in some cases at some points better than he knew himself and he knew me in some cases right. better than I said, so we were just really, really close. And, um, and a lot of things that we used to share when we were kids, you right. know, are things that, you know, defy right now that I'm hearing it's, and I don't, you know, obviously, you know, now who's saying what and where it comes from is an interesting thing, but it's really unfortunate. Cause you know, I mean, you know, this guy, you know, um, was obviously an amazing talent and, um, deserved and earned, you know, um, his spot in musical history. Um, yeah. and so the idea that, you know, his legacy is uh, sort of in this weird sort of limbo or whatever you want to call it, you know, is really, uh, I just, it breaks my heart. It really does. Because, you know, I mean, I know how much he sacrificed. I know specifically some of the things that he, you know, he sacrificed to to be you know, the person that he became and to, you know, have the kind of career that he had. So, right. Yeah. You talked about family. I'm sure that affected his closeness with his family. I mean, you had no time, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. Well, what he did. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, that's the, the, the trade off with having that kind of success, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of people may not understand that, but, you know, you do sacrifice that, you know, you sacrifice, you know, even for me, obviously, um, you know, I, I had to, I didn't want to make that sacrifice because I, you know, when I had kids, um, you know, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't walk away from that. I, you know, I, it's hard to do to, for your heart and soul to be in two places. And, you know, one of, you know, somebody that I really um, admire and respect a lot that was kind of a mentor uh, for me um, was Prince's father. And one of the things that he said was that when you have kids, you know, you got to stop. You got to, you got to raise right. your kids. And, uh, and I, you know, I always remember that. And so when I had kids and I, I tried to produce and even that got to be really hard. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, but the beauty is, you know, one of my older sons, you know, um, was, uh, we were having a conversation. He was sharing with me all the different things that we did, you know, mm -hmm. like riding bikes all through Chinatown and all in little Tokyo, cause I lived <laughs> downtown. And, and he was telling me all these different stories and how much fun he used to have. And, you know, we used to play basketball and, you know, all the kind of stuff that we used to just have a lot of fun and, and right. you know, big loft. And uh, in fact, in my loft, um, uh, Lisa's mother, <laughs> Lisa from Lisa and Wendy, her mother used to live in the same um, uh, uh, um, uh, loft space. Oh, OK. Yeah. So she was like, we became really, really good friends. Right. So anyway, just it was I mean, him telling me that now as a grown man and how much it meant to him. Right. Helped me understand if I didn't, you know, obviously what a great sacrifice and, you know, um, you know, it was, it was beautiful and I would right. do it and, you know, so, you know, you did and, the right thing. You did the oh, right thing. Absolutely the right thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. We, I mean, talking about, I mean, obviously, you know, Prince inside and out and we're there growing up and 
making your way in the music business. I it, I feel the same. You're more personal because you were involved with that. But just seeing like the people who knew him the best should be, you know, they should be calling you and saying, hey, you know, we want this. You know, can you give us some advice? And what? I don't know. It's, it's kind of sure you got so many hands and ideas. Yeah. And it's nuts. Hey, you know, I, I, you know, they did, you know, they did reach out and I did talk to them, but, you know, some of them, yeah. you know, they probably had a lot of people in their ear and, you know, from different perspectives with different motives, who knows? Right. But, you know, I mean, all I can, you know, I just said, hey, if you ever need anything, I'm here. I'm happy. That's right. Yeah. I've been doing this stuff for a long time. <laughs> I know a lot of really good people. Um, yeah. You know, that are really good hearted people that are not shady. And, you know, so if you ever need, you know, I told him that. So, you know, it's like, you know, it's all done. That's all you can really do. You know, I mean, I, yeah. I don't make anybody do anything, obviously, you know. Um, right. And, you know, and I think, you know, one thing that I've learned that I didn't know, um, I mean, I guess I should have, um, you know, um, I should have assumed, I guess, because obviously I was on the first three tours. You right. Know, I, you know, kind of helped, you know, to a large degree build, you know, that fan base, you know, because we were out there working our behinds off. I mean, right, you know, right. Especially that Rick James tour was like, you know, we were kicking <laughs> booty. Right. You know, um, that was the, with uh, Zap. Yeah, Rick Zap. Yeah. Rick right. James, Zap. I mean, we, we, you know, uh, Lenny White. Um, I think there was a Dougie Fresh, uh, Slick Rick, um, Ready for the World. You know, it was there was a lot of people on some of those tours. But you know, right. we were out there. You know, I mean, and you know, uh, we we established some 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 new ground. And right. uh, obviously, it's Prince's thing, so he gets all the credit. But you know, I mean, I think the reality is, and those who really understand know how much you know that presentation how solid it was, you know, because right. I think even I think when the Rolling Stones, um, you know, said, hey, you know, we want you to open. I think it's because they saw, you know, the version when I was in the band. Right, <laughs> you know, right. You know, I mean, the thing about me is I just I'm, I'm one of those kind of performers, um, you know, especially back then who I just don't, I, you know, I, you know, I'm a very take no prisoners kind of thing, you know, um, mm -hmm. Like we need to go out and we need to just rip everybody's head off. That was always my attitude. It's like you yeah. know, and um, and I'm just I'm you know I'm not shy when it comes to that you know, and um, and I think that energy and you know same with Des and you know and then eventually and people might not realize this now because obviously, you know Prince is uh, an icon and you know and a legend and, and rock and roll hall of fame and all of that, but he was that was not in the beginning, not quite the case that developed and I think he gained confidence from myself and from Des because Des had been doing it as a lead uh singer for a long time. You know, and in our band, you know, um, you know, I was kind of, you know, I wasn't the lead singer all the time, but right a lot of the time and so was, you know, um our percussionist, um uh William Dowdy. So, you know, so I so I just think, you know, you know, so it was a new thing, you know, Prince at the Capri it was that that was his first time, you know, uh fronting a band, you know? right. so you know, so it was. Well, uh, was it as a uh, raw or like, hey, we got to go back and work on it, kind of thing? I mean, I just read reviews and hear people talk about it. What, what, what kind of show was it? Oh, uh, the Capri was uh, his very first show as a, as right. a solo artist, and it was, yeah. um, it's you know, he had signed a record company, uh, signed to Warner Brothers, and you know, had his first record out, and it was, you know, um, and so it was his first outing, and you know, he just. You know, um, he was just, you know, he was kind of deer caught in the headlights. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I, I had to have one of those talks that we used to have some every night <laughs> about yeah. why we got to get up on stage. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we got to go get into this, uh, you know, rip this, rip this show apart. Right. And, and we ultimately wound up doing it. It just, you know, and so, you know, but we, you know, then once he got acclimated, you know, he found his, you know, he found his, um, his voice and found his persona. And once right. he, once he did that, it was, it was, um, you know, the rest is literally. <laughs> just, I mean, he just built up on it, you know, yeah. There was yeah. not a lot of reg regression. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, hey, uh, let, let me ask you a stupid question. The, the, uh, the see-through pants, the plastic pants they used, I don't even know what they were, but yeah. whose idea was that and how uncomfortable to, 
to do shows with that. No, that was my idea. I found them, okay. you know, because we, you know, um, me and Prince obviously used to um, just, you know, when we were making the records, we I was always there. I mean, San Francisco, mm -hmm. we made the first one in L.A. when we mixed it. In Los Angeles, we made the second one, you know, yeah. and then together when we made the third one at, at his house in Minnesota. But, um, you know, but when we, when we would travel, you know, um, you know, we would go to some of the funkiest shops. And in New York, um, there was a place called Trash in Vaudeville. Um, there was another place called Jumping Jack Flash that was in okay. New York, in the village. Um, but I think I found the first pair there. Um, and then I found a place here in LA. Then I found a place in DC. And so every time I would find them, I just buy, you know, um, and then, you know, they, um, the management really, they, you know, once he got new management, they wanted to redesign his whole presentation and make it less about, you know, a band presentation and more about oh, okay. solo artists. The league guy, yeah. So I found it, you know, they started, you know, they started, uh, my, my, my bag started getting lost. Um, <laughs> At, air, at airport security. Wow. And, like, and it took me a minute to realize, oh, I get it. They're trying to take my wardrobe, so I won't right. wear that. Yeah. No, it was totally my idea. I mean, I, yeah. nobody would tell me what to wear ever. Hey, as you Prince know? say, they were, you guys were going to the, the edge, the ledge or whatever, you know. Yeah. yeah pretty no, much, yeah. Yeah. No so you, you, uh, you played the bottom line in New York, right? On one of yeah. those tours? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the first that was the first New York gig, I believe. It was, yeah, yeah. Uh, when uh, John Lennon was um, assassinated. Right. Yeah, you had mentioned that and walking around and wow, that's. Yeah. yeah, we start. We went by the Dakota that day before, right? Literally, almost right before. And then I was, I had gotten some sort of cold, so I was like laying in bed listening to Screaming Jay Hawkins, <laughs> feeling oh, okay. like, yeah, feeling like maybe you know it might have been my time because I was like, <laughs> I was, I was I, I, yeah, I woke up here and. <laughs> I was like, I was like yeah. all that red, and it was like all this, you know, weird, you know. Um, right. then, uh, then the news broke in, and they talked. They they announced that that had happened, and I was like, oh my god. So, uh, yeah, just yeah. a pivotal. I mean, that whole Beatles and all the. And you mentioned yeah. the Beatles before, and everything was per, was Prince into the Beatles as well. Oh yeah, yeah, he was. He was. Um, you know, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think. I don't know if. I or my family, or just the fact that we had the records around the house, because I really don't know what he, um, you know, got into before he came to live with us. Um, right. Um, but, um, you know, I do know he had, uh, um, he used to babysit for a, a DJ um, mm -hmm. who had a little girl and, and, and the DJ had, you know, a, a, a massive record collection of, it was mostly 45, so it was a little right. bit different. So, um, but, so, but I, I just, you know, um, it sounded like it was more of a, an R and B um, kind of thing, um, and not so much. I mean, and, you know, like I said, I was blessed to have siblings that were really into a lot of diversified uh, musical content, and uh, definitely the Beatles. And once I heard, and then my cousin, I had a cousin, Bobby Dean, who was older, but he was a musician, yeah. and he was really, you know, influential in terms of, um, you know, kind of hip and to stuff. He'd come over, hey, cuz, listen, have you heard this? And he play, you know, um, you know, all kinds of just avant-garde stuff right. that I never heard of. And he knew I was into music. And, and the beautiful thing about having a, a, a big family like I, I did is people are always, and once they find out you're really into music and you're like dedicated, right. they come by with all kinds. They, they want to, you know, share and, and hip you to stuff and help mm -hmm. you. And that's exactly what they did for for me and Prince benefited right. as well. By. So Bobby Dean, he was in uh, your solo band, right? Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember yeah. seeing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's get to that. Um, you and Prince parted ways, but you, this was kind of like, you know, you guys had kind of forecast that. Yeah. Well, Just we more, did. Yeah. I, mean, I did. I mean, because right. you know, I, I, you know, I mean, you know, you have to understand, we were in a, a band that was not like a Prince banner by no right. stretch. You know, and if you think about it, you know, three out of the five members in our band all wound up solo artists on Amer American Bandstand. Right, So yeah. that might be some sort of record, I don't know, but yeah, we were all, you know, artists in our own right. So the mm -hmm. idea, you know, of, um, you know, being just, you know, background in somebody's band was nothing that I was ever, you know, all that interested in. 
Um, but I will say this, I mean, you know, because, um, you know, uh, a lot of people, <laughs> something a lot of people don't realize is that we were really, um, uh, our band was really focused on, on, on um, getting a record deal and, and trying to get, make all that kind of stuff happen when, you know, um, you know, at the time that Prince wound up getting his um, uh, solo deal. So, right. um, you know, and I just had a choice to make between, you know, a, a record deal with the band that I was in or, mm -hmm. or my friend who had, you know, got his record deal. So I was like, yeah, like I go out with, you know, the band and, you know, but the Prince is my best friend and, you know, right. And he was like, literally, come on, man, you got to do this. You got to, you know, this means a lot, you know? And I was like, and so I was like, all right, you know? And so we right. went to San Francisco and, you know, um, you know, I don't know, I'll never know. I, hopefully I, I, I like to think that that was the right choice, but uh, mm -hmm. it was the choice, you know, cause I, I chose my friend. Right, and, uh, right. You know, and, you know, I mean, we, we had a lot of fun, you know, I mean, I got no credit, <laughs> zero well, credit. Well, do me baby, come on, right? There yeah, you go. I didn't get credit for that. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, let, so let's tell years. people that that was, uh, you wrote that song, right? Yeah, I didn't get credit for that until years later. And, and really, right, right. you know, um, it just showed up one day uh, in, in in checks, and you know, um, which I was like, because um, I, I didn't make a big deal out of it. And I never even ran around telling anybody that I wrote it. I didn't, you know, you know, that was just something between Prince and myself, but other people who knew made it an issue, but I never made it an issue because that was just something between my friend and myself. And I just, you know, said, hey, you know, between he and I, he knew, <laughs> you know. Right, right. And, uh, and eventually he 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 did the right thing. And, you know, I appreciate it. I mean, you know. Um, yeah, that was a staple of his concert, you know. Yeah, no. It was, time, yeah. Well, it was, it, it was a great song because if you think about it, it's, it's the bass pattern and, you know, I mean, because a lot of the songs back then were driven by the bass patterns, you know, which were a lot of a lot of the stuff that I was a part of creating because I was a bass player. And I managed to create, I, I took it, I took pride in creating a very unique bass style that um, you know, um, you know, it was just my you know, it was my own style. And I really, really worked on that, you know, and yeah, right. the idea that, you know, um, that I just don't get any credit for that. I just, I almost stopped playing bass for a while because, you know, I played, people said, you sound like, it's like, oh my God, ooh, this hurts. This really yeah. hurts. Like, you know, cause my, my dad was a bass player. Yeah, right, right. He knows how, you know, dedicated I was. Cause I would, I would literally, and I've told the story before, but I literally would learn horn solos, like sax solos and trumpet solos. Cause I played horn and I would learn, cause I got bored playing bass parts. But mm -hmm. what I think that did is that's what helped me create that that bass style is because you know you learn horn solos they're completely a different way of approaching uh, melodic uh, interpretation so that that became again you know um you know part of what people like to call the minneapolis sound and you know um and some other things that you know I, you know i was very much a part of creating because we were right. we were literally creating that sound what a lot of people don't know but we were creating that for a specific purpose <laughs> Right, and right. Not just some random, you know, I've, I've heard so many different, you know, interpretations of why the Minneapolis sound is what it is and who invented it and who came up with it and all of that. And that's wonderful. And, you know, and some of it's, you know, is, is you know, I'm not trying to take anything away from anybody because I think, mm -hmm. you know, in Minneapolis, we had some of the most really, really amazingly talented um, musicians and artists and all of that. But, um, but I just know that specific sound. Um, I know where it came from and I know why I know what, what it was rooted in. And, you know, I mean, I have, you know, um, tapes that I created, um, right. back then I have tapes that, you know, we created together as a band back then. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of that stuff that, you know, reflects to a certain extent, you know, what we were attempting to do back then. Um, but, you know, and so, you know, so I know, I mean, not only yeah. do I know, but I have, you know, um, content <laughs> right right to, to to you know to play one day you know if it's you know if when, whenever that that day comes or it seems like it might be you know something that might you know people might be interested in you know um you know because i think you know people might find it fascinating to hear some of that stuff you to hear the the actual um you know evolution 
of some of the stuff that, you know, at least I know I was creating back then. And, you know, and obviously, you know, as our band was growing and developing, we were creating different things. And, you know, obviously I was very much a part of it because like I said, you know, yeah. most of the people in the band were people that I, you know, um, you know, um, brought on board. Um, so, um, yeah. So you should be well represented in the Minneapolis Sound Museum. Jelly Bean will have you up there, right? Yeah. Well, you know, you never know. I mean, I, 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 I'm not going to hold my breath anymore about, you know, um, I realize, you know, at this point, you know, I think people feel real comfortable um, with where their, um, where their place is in this sort of, you know, whatever, um, uh, you know, interpretation of the creators of the Minneapolis Sound. All I know is I'm still creating music and I'm going to yeah. continue to create music. And it started with the music and it's going to always be about the music. And so right. if they're still creating music, that's still, you know, yeah. speaking to the people like I like I like to think that I am and like I'm going, going to continue doing because the resurrection of funk, if you weren't sure, you know, yeah. about Andre Simone being a part of the yeah. pioneer of whatever, you listen to this record, that's going to answer yeah. a whole lot of questions. And, and, and people will have will have the links up on, on the screen here and also in, in the description. But um, the best place to get the new music is right through Bandcamp? Yes. No? So, okay. Um, Bandcamp. Oh, boy. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. Yeah. I'll, we'll, we'll have the links up there. Good. Yeah. Because yeah, I want to get it yeah. wrong. <laughs> I, I was thinking back to your friend, uh, Jill Jones, when we were down back in Connecticut. She came to the studio with Ian Ginsberg and they played live in the studio. And we were somehow kind of similar to what you were saying about back. That music was more like kind of rock pop ish. And she says, I'm still going to play funk music. It just happens to be this is what I was feeling that particular day. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. It, was, it didn't leave. Right. Yeah. Huh? I no, no. I, I said it didn't leave you guys, you know. Oh, no. no. <laughs> it's never going to leave. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, it'd be one thing if I weren't, you know, a content creator. I mean, because right. I, you know, I can, I literally play, like in the, the songs that you heard, I'm playing everything, you know. Yeah, um, yeah, I figured, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, so I can create, you know, um, whatever my mind can conceive. And so, um, yeah, and and Jill, I mean, she's just a beautiful soul. She's really a, 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 a special artist in her own right, and she's, you know, she's got her own way of thinking. She loves her own. She's got her own way of, you know, the kind of stuff she likes to do. And she's got a, I mean, she's got a history and a background um, that really, you know, um, speaks for itself, I think, you know. Right. And, and I, she, I thought it was cool. Um, recently, there was, it was out in LA. It was Prince Day, you, Jill, Dr. Mm -hmm. Funkerberry, Jam, Jerome. I, did I leave anybody off? Terry, Terry Lewis. Oh, Terry, yeah, Terry, flight time. Terry and and Jimmy Jam, yeah. What was what was that like? Uh, and what what happened that day? Man, that was it was cool. It was it was good to see those guys because um, you know Jimmy's my cousin, which is always interesting to see him. Um, Terry, I grew up with. We went to school together. He's a little older than me, but we went to school together. He was an amazing athlete. So um, yeah, that's what I hear. Until he tore up his knee a little, right? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Um, I just know that obviously he's he's doing quite well. <laughs> yeah, him. that's right. Multiple bases. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, but you know, the interesting thing is, you know, because you know, I think sometimes, you know, they forget I'm still the same Andre uh -huh. that I've always been. So I was just kind of, you know, cracking jokes and you know, Terry's he's a little more serious, although he finally realized Andre's the same because I was cracking jokes. We were at, at the, we were at City Hall and they had this big table in front of all these, you know, all the different, you know, um representatives. And I was like, you know, you want to go out there and play ping pong on the table, don't you? <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> I said, Man, I wish they'd had a cupcake. <laughs> so I was just kind of, you know, kind of right. messing a little bit. But and Jerome's but, always serious, right? No, I'm just kidding. Jerome's never <laughs> Jerome, <laughs> we were having fun. Jerome is fun. That's another oh, yeah, yeah. He's he's yeah, he's great like, guy. We had, we had so many times hanging out with him at the time shows and everything. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. Like, he definitely, if, if the crowd is dull sitting there, you know, it's like a comedy show. He'll go right in there and start looking at the bill on your table and start cracking. On it. Yeah. No, he yeah. is, he is, he is, he is a consummate performer, but he's just a good person. He's got, a yeah, good yeah. Spirit. And he, and he's working with Jimmy and Terry, right? He has been. Um, if he's not, he should be, but I think he is. I, I I'm not completely sure, but right. You know, yeah. If he's not, he should be because he's he's just, you know, he's going to add 
just that element of of really um, heart and and energy in anything he he steps in and gets involved in. Yeah, um, I, I think I've told you be, before, but for for the audience who haven't heard, you you were the first person I ever had an interview with back. I think it was eighty three, wow. and it w I think it was your second record. You did a tour on uh, surviving in the eighties, right? I did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so. I was 18 or 19. I'll, I'll, you know, condense this, but I was living at my mom's house. I had just gotten into radio. I was working for a commercial station. The phone rings. My mom says, oh, it's phone calls for you. It was Owen Husney on the line. He wow. goes, uh, are you ready to do the interview with Andre Simone? I said, uh, uh, I could be in the studio in like an hour. I didn't even know how I contacted. I got right. to the studio. I, I talked to you. That was my first interview. So I'm indebted to you for, oh, wow. you know, yeah, so, it was. It, you were playing. I was in Connecticut, but you obviously were playing in New York, and we were hyping it up. Yeah, I think. I uh, but I was like a nervous, nervous kid growing up listening to you and the Minneapolis and Prince and everything. I think I had to get the uh, reel to reel and splice and the tape and all that just to make wow. it sound airworthy. If it's, if it's any consolation, I didn't do many. I didn't like doing interviews, so uh -huh. you know, I, I literally. Back then, I hated it because I just thought, you know, they used to ask some of the most um, crazy questions like, you know, what's your favorite color? And, you know, I would just say really, you know, I would always say, you know, because and, you know, I, I, it wound up getting me in trouble. And that's why I literally stopped doing interviews in 1985 and didn't do them again until 2012 or 2014 or something. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, no, because it yeah. was they would ask me stuff, and I just thought the questions were so ridiculous. So they right. they would ask me about Prince and what you know. They would always ask me stuff about Prince, and I'm like, "Are you interviewing me or Prince?" So I would just say, "Well, we would tie girls up on the roof of my mom's house and duct tape them to the leg gate, <laughs> and you know, I would just say stuff, and you know, they print it. Yeah, you know, yeah. They, what's your favorite? You know, what's your what's your sign? I'd say, you know, alligator. <laughs> you know, I would just say stuff. Right, would, right. And uh, and and it would always be, you know, people think that I was just some weirdo. And I just, you know, I, it wasn't until um, I was working with Adam Ant that he gave me sort of a, a tutorial <laughs> on how to conduct, you know, um, a, a successful, decent sort of interview. Right. Um, and uh, and, you know, he said, well, Andre, when they ask you about Prince, just just say he's a snappy dresser and, uh, <laughs> you know, tell him, tell him he's a great guy. You know, he's saying fabulous and you know everything will be great and so i was like that's it i can do that <laughs> so, but um but well, i, I asked you yeah, yeah i asked you a stupid question i can remember this because it was like was your first instrument the synthesizer well <laughs> that was maybe that's why you stopped giving interviews <laughs> yeah uh yeah yeah because that, yeah. be, that would yeah. be that would make sense uh, you know but yeah yeah Teenager, but I was young. I was, yeah, I was like 83. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, obviously a synthesizer back then. I mean, you know, the first synth, synth real synthesizer I got my hands on was, you know, that uh Princess Four voice we got uh from Roger Dodger, um mm -hmm. uh, guy owner uh music place in Minneapolis. Um and um, you know, I was really into new technology. We had I had a couple of friends that really are, you know, kind of listened to really abstract and avant-garde music um and you know again you know that's the beauty of um you know growing up in the community that i i lived in especially at my mother's house because people would always come by right. and they tell me stuff about things that were that were new and cutting edge that i hadn't heard about and that was one of those things it was like you know man have you you've heard about this these new computers man it, they're called oberheims and i was like oberheim and i was like Prince, you heard about that? Oh, you know, we need to check into that, you know. And right. so, um, and so we researched it and we found out where you could, where we could get our hands on one. And it was a guy who uh, um, had a, um, a keyboard place in Minneapolis called uh, named Roger Dodger. Okay. Who um, he had. That's where we got. <laughs> you know, I, I I went in debt to Roger Dodger, literally right. <laughs> um, buying, you know, uh, obviously different keyboards. I wanted to buy this. A PPG wave term, which is like, I don't know, it's twenty nine thousand dollars, something crazy like that. On those, I was one of the only three people in the country that had one. Me, Thomas Dobie, and Stevie Wonder at the time, and you know, I just. Oh. But uh, but you know, anyway, it was just fun stuff back in those days. Yeah, and uh, you know the sound you had on your solo records, especially the first two, 
you know, mm-hmm. utilize a lot of, let me ask you, I mean, this, the technique you had, some of the vocals on those first two solo records kind of how, singing into it, it was like a little distorted. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. How, how did you do that? Well, you know, a lot of it was, I was really trying to create a totally different, you know, it's like, it's like I was talking about, we try to create a specific sound back right. for a band, you know, I was doing that back then, but when, you know, Prince came out and his, everybody, he became synonymous with that vibe. And I just didn't want to come and go, oh, you're trying to be like that. So I just created, wanted to create a whole new sound. And so I, that's what I was trying to do with that record. And so I wanted it to be a little edgy. And, you know, I was listening to a lot of um, uh, um, Devo and craft work and, and um, you know, Yellow Magic Orchestra and, and um, mm-hmm. some different groups that were doing some different stuff. Um, and so I wanted to incorporate some of that with like, you know, kind of a little bit of an R&B um, funk uh, perspective. And so that's what I, you know, created what I used to call New Wave. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it didn't help that Prince in the time went on that we don't like New Wave. So then it became, you know. Was that a dig at you? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, it was because, you know, a lot right. of people said, well, you know, because he was, you know, and a lot of the fans were like, they felt like they had to choose between. Right. You know, Prince and the time stuff and me doing new wave. Not that we were, they didn't look at us anymore after that. Like we were all from the same, not just the same city, but the same literally group. Right, um, right, right. So it created this whole, because I would hear a lot of, you know, a lot of people say, well, Prince said he doesn't like new wave. You're doing new wave. And right. I was like, wow. Okay. Um, but, you know, I just kept doing it, you know, because um, I just really wanted to make my own statement anyway. So. Right. You know, people, some people really, really got into it. And, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I still got the record. So, and, and, you know, obviously you and Prince, you know, got together again for the dance electric. Still, I, I mean, whether it's his version or your version, it's just a smash that. It is. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that that's a song that go on for 25 minutes and I'd never get tired of it. It really could. It's a great yeah. song. You know, and, and, you know, I think the thing about, um, about that song is, um, you know, there's a lot of things about it, really. I mean, because um, you know, we had done a record um, with um, with uh, with a group called the Rebels that right. we did oh, yeah. Yeah. during a break, and the the lead single was going to be a song that I wrote called "Thrill You or Kill You." Um, mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, um, but me and Prince had had a conversation about the kind of music I wanted to do when I did my own thing, and I used to always talk about how I would love making political statements. And uh, we were just, it was just a conversation. So when he came with that song, it was like, I got this song for you, man, you're gonna love it. And he was telling me about sort of the, um, you know, the, the the message and the music. And I was like, that sounds cool, but I, I just didn't want to, I really didn't want to do it because I didn't want to be, you know, um, you know, connected with, you know, um, Prince in that way. And people saying, oh, the only reason why you made it was because of Prince and all that kind of stuff. Right. And, um, and you know, I just didn't want to have that even be a part of any kind of conversation. But you know, you know, I talked to my mom, and you know, because he kept, you know, he was adamant about it. And you know, and right. when my record company heard about it, they were like, "Oh, you got to do it. You got to do it." And, and you know, and so everybody around my management at the time, and everybody was like, "It'd be a great thing if you guys could, you know, bring yourself, come back together, and you know, um, sort of heal all the wounds and you know, whatever, whatever." And so, you know, and he, he came by with his dad, um, who was, like I said, was like a mentor to me. And, and, and you know, and they played the music and I sat there, I listened to it. And I said, you know what? You know, at the end of the day, it's about friendship and it's it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And I said, let's do it. And so, you know, we wound up doing it. And it was really something he had already done. I really had, you know, very little right. to do with it. Um, right. and I, I would never try to take any credit. It's just his thing. And, you know, he just wanted to do that because of obviously, um, a lot of the music we had done. And, you know, I think it was also a way for him to, you know, want to sort of, you know, I guess, mend some of the, you know, the the song uh, right, country yeah. I may not have gotten credit for. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, whatever, whatever the reason is, yeah. it really, you know, to be honest yeah. with you, it doesn't so, matter. Yeah. It was a friend and uh, yeah. he's really uh, talented. I, I didn't. I just found out the other day. I didn't know you guested with him at the Warfield Theater in San Francisco on Dance Electric. He brought you out on stage and a faster version. Yeah. But yeah, that yeah. was that was cool. Yeah, right? uh, 
It was. It was very cool. There was a. It was amazing um, night, and there was another gig. You know, which it's it's amazing because I just I don't remember it, but it's it's um and it was it's on something. Um, but you got to go to talk to Dwayne Tudor, Dwayne Tudor or uh, PrinceVault.com. Dwayne Dwayne knows all the dates. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, he does. He really does. But um, but this one, you know, it's interesting because it's um, you know, I think they released it, and I don't. I think I'm not in the release. But oh, okay. there's a copy of it, and I'm killing. Well, it. she. I think <laughs> Sheila. There was a uh, release she played at the Warfield. I don't know if it was around the same time or not, but it was. It would have to be around the same time. Um, yeah, the Bengals came on stage. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, don't, I don't remember that, but I remember. Um, I remember. Um, I remember the San Francisco gig because I remember running into, believe it or not, my my ex Kelly, um, oh, Kelly's okay. eyes, Kelly. Um, and right. uh, who was at the time was, or actually she's married now, but she was just dating. Um, 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 God, what was his name? Uh, is it Valentino or, um, anyway, something like that. Um, um, uh, Alantini, I forgot. Anyway, um, okay. uh, she was dating, you know, and he, um, Giorgio, Giorgio, that was. Oh, Giorgio. Yeah. Yeah. She was dating him and I had met him and, you know, um, and, uh, and you know, it was, it was, it was great. It was great to see her. It was great. And so I always think about that because, you know, she had, she had talked about because you know, you know, we were really close back then when I was mm -hmm. making my, you know, first record. And um, in fact, I, I stayed at her house, her parents' house, when I was making my first record. Um, mm -hmm. So we were, it was it was great. It was great catching up. It was great to meet him. Um, and so yeah, it was just you know that whole that was such a um, a throwback because I think that might have been there's a picture of um, of. Uh, um, that I always see online of me, Jill Jones, Kelly, and I'm talking to Prince. I think you can see, um, um, I know Jamie Shoup was in the picture, Chick was in okay. the picture. Um, but it's a really, it's actually a funny picture because- I'm gonna you have know, to try to find that one, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm talking to Prince and, and you can tell uh, I'm, I'm doing, I'm probably giving him a hard time because you know, <laughs> I, you know, I used to get a kick out of give, giving him a hard time. Uh, you know, yeah, um, yeah so. So so then after the the first three records and everything you just transitioned right into a hugely successful songwriting production career for other artists you know Jody Watley if if people don't know Jody Watley won best new artist of the year for the Grammys right yeah yeah she won yeah, Grammy and th this gentleman produced wrote probably played just about everything on the record himself right yeah everything except horns yeah um, okay and that was just a sax part that uh scott mayo played but you know yeah yeah, yeah. and just wow that would so then um the video you're playing all these different instruments as well for the video so um yeah well yeah, what, uh, a few of them yeah well there's one that i think i'm playing um i'm playing drums yeah right uh, yeah. one i think i'm you know um just i think she once she had me cast as her love interest kind of thing. right and I think that's, but that's not the one I did. I, and don't you want me? I'm in the video, but I didn't. Right, right. Um, so, so recently, or maybe a couple of years, you uh, came back on stage, played with Jody a few few yeah. songs and, on her gigs. What was that like getting back together? You were playing guitar on that gig, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, it was, it was great. I mean, you know, I, um, she had reached out, and it was, uh, you know, an anniversary gig, and she said, "Hey, do you want to come and join me?" And you know, I said, right. Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, and it was so much fun, you know. And, right. and we just had, we just had a lot of fun because you know, obviously, I think she's a great artist, and her, you know, she's got an amazing voice, and those songs are just really timeless. Um, yeah, and, I mean, they they still hold up. I mean, still a thrill is one of my favorites. Yeah, that's, um, that's she's on, on those records, you know. Um, and uh, you know, we did a lot of stuff. I mean, we did a, a this um, twenty seven piece orchestra version of. Uh, of um, um, after you, Cole Porter, song oh, wow. we did okay. for Red Hot and Blue, um, mm -hmm. and uh, it was it's amazing. I I, get, I got a chance to you know do an orchestration thing and really kind of get with like a whole huge big band orchestra, and it was beautiful. Loved it, right. loved it, loved it. And 
So, so as Jody's got to invite you on her show to talk about the resurrection of the funk, right? The new record. Say that you broke up a little. Bit. I said, oh, I said Jody's got to invite you on her show to talk about your new record, the resurrection of the funk. That would be great. I would love hint, it if hint. she does. Um, because yeah, I mean, I would have, be happy and be you know obviously honored right. to go on and, and talk about it. Um, you know, because you know, I think with this record, I you know, um, I I try to avoid as much as I can getting too much into um, you know, too much of the political stuff because I, I really love to speak on you know the politics of music right important um i'm not sure if this connection is still good but I'm yeah you're freezing up a little bit because it's uh, i see that this yeah but yeah, yeah. no I, I tried to get away from you know getting into too much politics on this one and i just really want to have fun and so mm -hmm. um i'm really kind of focused on that and you know um and it's really i mean there's so many tracks on here that i think people are really going to enjoy because it's just fun it's just fun music it's just stuff that you can put on and and just right. party to you can just dance to it you know i mean i you know i, I my um my nephew um omar brown just signed to uh uh the denver broncos and he oh, was having okay. a little party in uh in, in dallas and uh, we went up there and and while we were we were there because it was um you know it was draft day and okay. i wanted to play it because i always i used to do this back in the day is play music uh to my family just to sort of get a feel and they were if my family is you know is partying and jumping and getting you know right getting in into your your groove you're it's on something because something, they don't yeah, right. they have no yeah they have no problem saying you need to go back to the drawing board huh? <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. so but anyway. hey you know what before we close out and before i don't know if the connections um oh there you go you're back in in sync but anyways um something i there's a clip if people want to go just type in andre simone on on youtube that you're jamming with mostly younger cats, young ladies and guys in a rehearsal. You're playing bass and funking it up. And the coolest thing I thought was like in the middle of the song, the keyboardists take out their cell phones and recording you playing. And then the oh. other side, yeah, in the middle of a song. Yeah. What, what was that? What was going yeah. on there? What, who, who were those um, was, musicians? It with was you? a rehearsal for a show I was doing. And, um, and you know, um, you know, I think, you know, because I, I really hadn't played bass that much, you know, because I was just trying to, I was just, you know, showing everybody kind of um, the track and how to do whatever. And so, um, and during, um, there was a, a part in that track um, where me and the bass player kind of do like a, a bass duel kind of right. thing. And, um, and you know, and they, they've been waiting for me to play bass because they, they've heard that I'm like this bass player that's, you know. Right. So, you know, and 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 um, and really when I when I really get into it, I mean, because I really don't, you know, um, I don't um, get into it as often as I probably should. But when I do, especially when I sit and practice a little bit, then I'm I, I'll, I'll, I'll tear anybody up. I don't care who right, it is. Right. <laughs> Give me two weeks to yeah. rehearse straight and I will rip anybody's head off. I don't care. Bring, they can bring all they, comers. <laughs> yeah, bring all comers. You can talk all the stuff you want, but give me two weeks where I can focus and believe me, you, you'll you hear stuff you've never heard. Cause right. you know, I just don't, you know, cause I mean, a lot of people don't really, um, you know, the kind of music I like to do is just funk. I mean, I don't want to get too into, you know, getting into too riffy kind of stuff and stuff like that. Cause that's, you start losing some people when you do that, but it's not like I can't, it's just that right. I pick and choose when I, I think, but anyway, they heard, they heard me doing that stuff and they were like, oh boy, that that's that guy. <laughs> They're just, oh yeah. Just, their phones and they started recording it but my bass player at the time he was he was killing it too he was giving me a run for my money <laughs> so so when you play the bass do you switch off playing with the pick and not with the pick or yeah I, I developed a thing back in the day where i i can hold i can pluck and you know and still have the the pick in my hand and oh, do all okay. that and sometimes i pluck and i can play with i play stuff with my right hand you know, along with my, I just, I, you know, like I said, I used to take it really serious and right. used to play things upside down and sideways and all kinds of other crazy stuff. Cause I, I really got into it when, you know, um, back, back early on, but yeah, I play with a pig because right. uh, a pig gives you a, a whole different sound. It's a different kind of, a, um, bass style that, you know, okay. I just got into back in the day. And, uh, it's, how about, it's, how about Prince? Did he play with the pick or just fingers? 
He plays, you know, because he, you know, I showed him literally how I play. He's like, man, how are you doing that? And, you know, and, you know, um, so I literally showed him <laughs> right. how I play and he picked it up. That's why a lot of the way he plays is a lot like me. Yeah. Um, and vice versa, because, you know, obviously, you know, um, he showed me a lot of, you know, um, some of the guitar licks and things like that that I, you know, learned throughout the years. I, I definitely picked up from him and, uh, you know, I mean, I had a guitar because, I mean, what a lot of people don't know is the first guitar, one of the first guitars he ever had, um, I got for him. I still have it. And, um, you know, that was what I would learn on and, um, mm -hmm. you know, what we played and what we used back in the day. Is, is there anything comes to mind concert wise or studio wise that you guys did together that you would love one day to see, you know, really presented well and get released with Prince? Yeah. I mean, you know, um, you know, some of those Rick James tours were amazing. I mean, we did, um, we were really, um, you know, some of the early shows, even before we did the Rick James tour, um, were really special. I think, um, you know, he um, lost his voice during the first tour. So we had to cancel um, part of that tour and uh, go back. To, we actually got stuck in Philadelphia, but we wound up going, going, to, uh, going back to Minneapolis. And he had to learn how to conserve his voice. And so when we went back out, you know, um, it, it he was able to you know deliver a lot stronger but um but yeah there's a lot of those shows i'm trying to think there's one in particular that i really oh the circle star which is where we met uh sheila um oh, okay that show, that show was amazing uh -huh. you know, that was i mean because i mean you know we we were supposed to open for cool and we did open that night for the cool and the cool in the game but we were supposed to open for them um on some kind of a tour but we were such we were we were so cocky after that show that they you know i think des accidentally kicked his his uh amplifiers <laughs> because was, our, you know it was the circle star you, you know one axe you know equipment is oh on yeah you're right on the side and and their keyboard players setup was right behind des's uh amps and when he reached over to kick his amp or whatever it fell on top of the keyboard player setup <laughs> So we got we got booted we got booted off yeah, of that right opportunity but we wound up on the rick james thing so right it kind of, it kind of worked out and uh mike murphy was on w with the rick james tour right your buddy yeah he was, he was. I yeah he was on the tour he wasn't with rick james but he was right on right on yeah um, i think he was yeah because he had mentioned about the the setup and everything good guy you guys you know an album people should not sleep on, which didn't get a lot of widespread release. The Mighty Soulmates with you, Gardner yeah. Cole, Paul Peterson, and Mike Murphy of the System. Yeah. That, yeah. Where did you record that, or it was in different spots? Uh, we re recorded um, a lot of it in in Gardner's studio, and a lot of the funky funkier stuff in my studio. Um, but um, yeah, no, it was such a fun project that you know it's it's. Um, you know, they released it after, I forgot what, however many years, because we did it in right. like 93, I think. Um, and right, it didn't come right. out until, you know, like last year. So, wow. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. The music, but you've seen it all from getting the first record deal to, yeah, pr production and today. Yeah. But you're, you know, you're calling your own shots and making great music. And um, how about what the, the future record? It's going to be released in, as a whole. Pretty soon, or yeah, we're just um, we're we're talking to some different people. So we really want to try to get it to as many people, and so it can get as much of a um, presence as we possibly can, you know. Um, and so we're talking to some different people to try to find, you know, um, you know, a way to really kind of get it to as many people as we can. So we're, you know, right. that's the one thing. And you know, we released a couple of songs, um, as you mentioned, um, yeah. and we're gonna release a, a couple more and. Um, and keep dropping out some clips and and until you know until you know people really become aware that this thing is coming yeah and, yeah uh, and we're gonna drop it you know um you know probably i'd like to think october november maybe we i'm not quite sure yet we'll see maybe before that maybe you know but we just definitely you know it's already done so we're just we're just trying to finish yeah, up a strategically program. put it out there yeah. Yeah. yeah the mastering and the mixing part of it but we've mm -hmm. finished all that we've got I think I had like 36 songs, so I'm trying to wow. tear it down. Yeah, a lot of music. Yeah, you got three records right there. <laughs> well, that's just for this. I still have. You oh, know, okay. Yeah, yeah, the you know I have another probably you know, 30, 40 songs that um 
will be for the resurrection part two. And then there's resurrection part three, which is sexy resurrection. Oh, okay. So, and that's wow, just the balance. <laughs> so, so we got total AC uh, to look forward to for the next few years, at least. Exactly. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to have some fun. Yeah. So we encourage our viewers, listeners, andresimone.com. Also, the new music, you can go to bandcamp.com and follow Andre on his social media sites and uh, support independent music. One of the cornerstones of Minneapolis sound, still going strong. You know, you, Jelly Bean, Paul, Matt Fink, Bobby Z, the guys, Monty, who were there mm -hmm. right from get-go, yeah. I mean, Gary Hines, we've had Gary on so many times. He speaks the world to you guys, so. You got to get Book Fate uh, on. You got to get Batman, David Island, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. I, he has not come on the show yet. I got to definitely get him on. Yeah, he's 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 a, he's a great artist and he's just a really cool person, mm -hmm. you know. And um, yeah. All right, I'm gonna write that down. E I L A N D, right? Yeah. Yeah. So thanks, Andre, man. You always been kind since at least to me and everybody else, and to me since 1982, 83. So cool. Here, here we are, still doing our thing. And as we should be, you know. Yeah, that's it. You're right, right. A beautiful thing. Yeah. So I appreciate right. it. Really yeah. Fun. And the resurrection of funk. We'll have Andre on to talk more about the upcoming music, hopefully down the road right there. Thanks, Andre. Thank you. Oh, yeah.